Okay, so again, welcome everybody to West Windsor Arts. We're excited to be presenting this lunchtime gallery series. Today we have um, Don Fletcher, who's gonna be talking about the artist Tashiko. Um, so we're very excited to have him here. Um, Don was a student of hers and um, him and his wife eventually purchased the property and are, is, are living in the space, but still have a running studio there and artists come in. I think they, they do an artist in residency program. So lots of artists are there as well. Um, I'm also going to do a shout out. It's also Dawn's birthday today. I just found out so we can wish him a happy birthday. Um, so from there, I'm just going to spotlight Dawn um, for everybody. And yeah, so I'll turn it over to you. Okay, and um, this is an unusual Zoom for me. I'm very glad to be here and I'm very glad. I'm one of those people who cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, so I have Carla being my camera person. And so I can't see any of you, but you'll get a lot fewer views of my feet and the floor and the sky and various things. And you'll see more of actually, but is worth seeing. Um, I went to Princeton to study physics, and it's a very good place to study physics. And by the end of my first year, I was pretty sure I wasn't cut out to be a physicist. And I was even more sure that none of the physicists there thought that I was cut out to be a physicist. And I'd been studying German, so I went to Europe on a summer exchange, work exchange program, and worked in the uh, second uh, urology clinic at the University Hospital in Düsseldorf. And I didn't know what to do on my weekends off. So I just went to art museums. And when I got back to Princeton, I found that my one of my roommates had made up with his girlfriend. And so she was there with him and she was an artist from, from uh, Tyler in Philadelphia. And so, of course, I generously shared all my expertise on art that I had accumulated by going to museums in Holland and Germany. And um, she said, well, if you like art, why aren't you in this ceramics class of Toshiko Takeitsu? And I said, well, I, I didn't know it existed. And she said, well, Toshiko, I think, is the best artist in America, and you ought to take the class. So obediently, I signed up for the class. And the first thing Toshiko said when I walked in is, too late. You are, you missed the first session. And I said, well, um, where do I sign up? I'll, I'll sign up for next semester. And she said, well, I don't know where anybody signs up. I just get a list. And I said, well, is there a waiting list? And she said, yeah, there's a waiting list. There are 30 names on it. And um, I said, well, uh, can I put my name on the waiting list? And she said, well, I've lost that. I don't even know where it is. It's somewhere around here, gesturing to her office, which was part of this, uh, a table in the studio. And she said, well, the class is starting. You might as well see what's going on. And so I, uh, I went in and I watched the class. And after it was over, I was hanging around. And she said, what are you doing here still? And I said, well, I was wondering if anybody had dropped out and I could you know, join the class. And she said, you saw all those people there. I don't even know what their names are. And I said, well, can I come back next week? And she said, you do whatever you want. And so I came back and I... And I never went away. I, I attended all the classes, and I, I did what she said, and and we struck up a relationship. Um, I will say that I I had been very ill my freshman year, and she took that very much into consideration. So she was not only a, a brilliant person, but she was a, a generous and considerate person. So where did Tashiko came come from? Um, she she was born in uh, Hawaii on the Big Island in the little town of Pipikoi. Her parents were 
indentured laborers from Japan. And she um, uh, lived there until they had finished their indenture when they moved to Maui to work on the watercress farm of uh, Toshiko's uncle. Her mother's brother had, a, had served his indenture out and had was making a living selling watercress in Maui. So they uh, they lived and worked there, and Toshiko took a um, you know went to school in the local school, and she dropped out in tenth grade because the family was very um, uh, they weren't they, they weren't making ends meet well, and so she took a job as a housemaid with a, on an estate nearby, and. Uh, was very um, beloved by the two girls whose maid she was. Shortly after she started working there, um, the family had to sell the estate due to losses during the Great Depression and move back to Honolulu. And the girls said, we're not going anywhere unless Toshi comes with us. So they um, moved back to Honolulu, and as it happened, uh, the family owned a ceramics factory there. And so Toshiko was a maid part-time and she worked in the ceramics factory part-time. And she quickly distinguished herself as a tile painter and an expert in wind chimes and ashtrays, which is interesting because those of you who attended her class at Princeton <laughs> know that the quickest way to get thrown out of the class was to make an ashtray. And I think the second quickest way might have been to make a wind chime. So Toshiko worked there um, and they uh, saw her ability and put her in charge of their um, kind of nonprofit uh, pottery studio at the YWCA. And uh, one day, uh, this the war was going on, and an Italian sculptor walked in named Carl Massa, Italian American, and he uh, quickly understood her uh, abilities and told her she had to uh, study at the University of Hawaii. And uh, she said, "Well, I never, I can't. I never finished uh, high school." And he said, too late. I've already set it up with Claude Haran. And now this is the story she told me. I've read a different version, but anyway, it's close enough. She started studying with Claude Haran at the University of Hawaii. I've never heard that she actually matriculated. Um, she probably didn't have enough money to even pay in-state tuition. But but she may have signed up for a few years. And um, uh, as it happens, she fell in love with Carl Massa. And as it happens, he left Hawaii without notifying her. And that might have been the end of that. But there, there's a sequel a little few years later, 10 years later. Um, but after some years, uh, Haran told her, look, I've taught you everything I can. Let's, uh, you, you have to study at the mainland in a real art school. And she said, I never, <laughs> I don't have enough money. I can't, you know, I can't pay for school here, let alone uh, travel to the mainland. And he said, well, too late. I've got a scholarship arranged for you. And um, he, he recommended either University of New Mexico or Cranbrook, and uh, she liked New Mexico. She was very impressed with the um, Native American ceramics and uh, Maria Martinez in particular, but she was even more impressed with Maya Grotel, who she thought had a lot to offer. So she went to Cranbrook and became the top student. She got the award for best student the first year. And she said, well, that's not, it wasn't fair because I was already an old lady then. 29 years old by the time she started at Cranbrook. And it's interesting, um, I sort of always discounted that, but in fact, she had been, since the 
end of the war, 1946, I think, she had been submitting her work to the Everson uh, uh, Art Museum's annual or biennial, biennial um, invitational art show. She had been applying for that, and her work had always, already been selected. So it's true that she was a, a very experienced and highly regarded uh, potter by the time she got into Cranbrook. Now, at, at Cranbrook, um, she, she was influenced by Maya Glotel. And this is the one piece we have, which is really reminiscent of Maya Glotel's work. Um, this little piece also is. It, it's too hard to see it right side up, but upside down, you can see the repeating pattern. We don't have any Grotel work here because Toshiko gave all her Grotel pieces to the, the museum in Finland and or to Jeff Schlanger, who was also a, a student of hers. She took a volcanic sand from Hawaii to, uh, to Cranbrook. And this is one of the experiments with volcanic sand that she she used. By the way, we know it's at Cranbrook because the TT signature in the middle that you may be able to see is surrounded by one or two concentric circles that she she carved in while she was trimming it. And then you can see as she went along in Cranbrook, these are these are pieces that are nominally have the repeating pattern. Uh, and, and threes or fours, but the, it's much freer until it really becomes hardly uh, viewable as a pattern. And then these, she's she's verging on abstraction. And that's, uh, so she was at Cranbrook until, uh, well, this uh, 1954 or something, when she was, uh, invited to work at uh, the University of Wisconsin to replace the great um, ceramicist and grass blower, Harvey Littleton. We, we have a little piece of Harvey Littleton's on our knickknack table, as we call it here. Um, this is a glass work by him. It, it's, the stand is broken. It's supposed to sit like this, but we put it like this because we haven't gotten the stand repaired. And after her uh, replacing Harvey for the uh, his sabbatical, she was asked to um, she was asked to uh, stay there permanently. They gave her a, a job with tenure. And she declined it because she doesn't didn't want to be under Harvey's thumb the whole time. And so uh, she got a call when she got back to Cranbrook from the Cleveland Institute of Art. And the question was, we heard you turn down uh, University of Wisconsin. And she said, yes, I did. And they said, well, would you, would you like to run the program here? Our, our guy is retiring and we'd like you to take over. And she said she would. So, um, uh, she took off, and when she got there, uh, um, she went to the office to sign in on the day she had been told to, and they said, well, we have a problem. We don't have a file on you. And she said, well, I have this letter telling me to come. And they said, yeah, 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 and here's your check for your housing and all that. But um, we don't have a letter of recommendation. So she said, call my hotel at Cranbrook. And there, there is a letter somewhere in our archive. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes, so I know it's there. I just don't know where it is exactly. But it's from Maya Grotel, and it says, um, to whom it may concern, Rita Shiko Takeetsu, she is capable. Sincerely, Maya Grotel. So that's the one letter of recommendation she ever got. Um, and... Um, she worked, she worked in Cleveland for years, 10 years. And in many ways, she didn't like it, particularly because of uh, um, the, the studying part of it, that is, the teaching part of it. 
because she had to give people all A's. And one particular person, she wanted to fail because uh, he hadn't shown up for class very much, was a, um, a person I knew as Katsi Toyota. He was from the Toyota industrial family. And he basically told her, you have to give me an A or it'll be the end of my life in Japan. I can't come to the US and, and have anything but an A. So she did. And it, it worked out very well because years later, he financed her exhibitions in Japan. But in, um, in Cleveland, she started making these forms <laughs> with uh, the little, um, uh, she called it a mask. If you look at it from the top, it's kind of a, a emoji kind of mask. Um, and then she started closing them off. And, and here are three. This, this piece has a still has a little neck on it, as though it's a, a weed bud bud vase or something. And this one has a even less identifiable neck. And here she comes to what she used for the rest of her life, which is just a basically a nipple that that she closed it off to, with the air hole in it, and that that form um, dominated her work. She kept making. She kept making um, bowls, of course. This one would have been made at Cranbrook because it's all black on the outside. But she started doing um, abstraction more and more. Um, this is one of the, the earliest pieces and, and she kept it all her life uh, because it kind of set her off on the, on the way she went. Then, then she uh, she used to go to New York every um, every month or so with a group of other professors to see all the the shows in the galleries and so on, and um, meet with people in New York. And uh, on the way, she passed the town of Clinton, which she liked a lot. There's a there's a beautiful. Um, Kind of a lake behind a, a dam and two two mills, and the she was within and within an hour of New York from there, and in, within an hour of Philadelphia, basically. So she she resigned from Cleveland after a while and built a studio at the um, music hall, and a couple of years later. A fellow at Princeton, a philosophy professor, said, uh, came up and said, "You should uh, work at Princeton." And she said, "I can't. They don't have an uh, a. They don't have an art program, and b. I don't have any degree from anywhere." She had never graduated from anything. She got working too soon, and so um, she came to Princeton, uh, to Clinton, and then a few years later after Princeton created basically the program in the visual arts to, um, in order to hire her, she moved out here to Quaker Town and, and built her studio. Now, I just want to take a little digression to mention her student from Cleveland, Barbara Tiso. And as long as I knew her, the Chico had this uh, very fine painting by Barbara Tiso that's showing up okay? okay? Yeah, it is. Um, and the thing that Tiso did is uh, Tiso saw her beginning to make nearly spherical pieces and said, you know, Toshi, you need a bowl. And I'm sure they had arguments about it, but um, Barbara Tiso built these molds. And they're molds that are just uh, hemispherical molds. And from then on, Toshiko started making um, pieces based on these molds. Now, the particular piece you're looking at here also has about a six inch uh, coil, flattened out coil inserted in there to give it a, a little asymmetry in, in terms of the um, perfect sphericalness. And then there's one here that we have where she 
Um, she didn't insert that. She she left it uh, almost a perfect sphere. Now perfection was never of much interest to her. She she was very happy with with things. Here's a here's a little place where it got rubbed. Um, putting it into the kiln and the glaze was rubbed off. She didn't mind that a bit. She could have she could have refired it. Um, in this case, she didn't. Um, and she never gave up working on the wheel. The almost all the pieces, I'd say all the pieces you saw against the fireplace over there, they were done on the wheel. And they're all the, the, the tallest one over there in the corner is about uh, three and a half feet tall, but they're all fairly large. And the interesting thing is when she built this house in 1975, she was one of the foremost weavers in the country. And here, uh, where I'm standing was the end of a huge loom, an eight foot loom. She never wove a thing on it as long as, as far as I knew. Um, it, all her beautiful, huge hats decorated the loom. And a comical reason I ended up here is she said, she gave the loom to Penland Art, Art School after she, um, she basically needed the space for her, for her documents. And she gave the, the loom away. She said she didn't like it. And I said, well, you can always put two grand pianos there and it'll be perfect. And she liked that idea. And as it happens, I have two grand pianos. I don't play either one of them well, but I have them. I have friends who can play. But she gave up weaving and she gave up painting when she moved here. And, and my theory is it's, it's because um, she could work on a scale, we'll see the kill later, but she could work on a scale that let her use her full painterly gesture. Um, she was five feet tall. This is not quite five feet tall. Um, and she didn't have any any restriction on her on her um, kind of choreographic glazing technique. Uh, she also kept working on smaller pieces. Um, I, this is a you can make a good argument that this is the best thing she ever made. On the other hand, you could pull nearly anything off our shelves and make that same argument. She was pretty masterful. Sure. Um, after some years here, uh, her student Pat Patterson had a, a piece or two um, cast at the uh, bells, basically cast at the um, Johnson Atelier down in Hampton, New Jersey, or whatever it is. It's the grounds for sculpture now. And the Shiga started. Uh, getting things cast there also. We'll, we'll visit the bells later. But when she started getting things cast, she reverted uh, you know, to the minimalism of, of her early, early uh, experiments in art. And um, you know, not only those repeated things of the spheres, this is a thing called tetragonalobus, Tetragon lobus is a kind of uh, lotus, and that's a, a bisected seed pod, I think. And um, so that's a, you know, she, she was always looking for something else to, to do to express herself. We'll head down to the studio now. I'll just stop here at some of the interesting and slightly eccentric uh, teapots she made late in life. Um, and a painting that was uh, we found in the storeroom lying on the floor is partly rotted at the bottom. That's just a sign of her. And this, this is pretty much as she left it, including the Studio Potter cover on the wall and things. We we don't feel any great need to change anything.
And the one thing Chico told me when I asked her what she wanted me to do with the place after she was gone, she said, just keep the studio running so the guys can work on it. So here's the studio. Hello there. Welcome, welcome. This is Max Del Mascardo building these um, teacups. There we go, some big teacups. And here's Beverly Romero, who is the sanding in New York City, hmm? <laughs> sanding the base of one of the teasers. We're firing the kiln um, this weekend, so we're fairly busy with things. Uh, the little plates and bowls over there are mine. And um, with Maxwell as a master of plate for stuff. I'm yeah. for Just working on some uh, some raw, raw clay things at the moment. I'm going to skip this firing, but you know, get in on the next ones. Maxwell lives down the road a mile and a half, and I'm, I'm claiming credit for introducing him to Tashiko. Certainly. No, I definitely wouldn't be doing uh, wouldn't be doing ceramics without Don or, or Toshiko. Don brought me here a couple of years into high school when I had just started doing ceramics um, and seeing you know the work here, seeing Toshiko and her work piled floor to ceiling and basically every square inch of the property was pretty inspirational and eventually went to undergrad for ceramics. Um, basically been doing it ever since. <laughs> And we'll take you around to the, the big kiln and we'll ring a bell. And I guess we'll be done except for the question. This is our, our showroom for our resident artists and, and uh, students from. Alaska. David Kaufman he does a series of iPhone things. Um, the great thing about my life is that I have a huge family of Toshiko apprentices and students who are the most wonderful people in the world. I don't know how if Toshiko turned them into wonderful people or if she just picked wonderful people to be her apprentices, but that's a really great game. Now, I was never her apprentice. I, I, that's a real uh, impressive qualification as Toshiko's apprentice. Even the summer apprentices, I consider it's a hard job. The, the year-long apprentices are just miracles of moral fiber and strength. Um, here's the kiln, and it was built in 1975-76 by Dick Hay, and Bill Bumbach, among other people, participated. Um, it's been rebuilt a few times, but the interesting thing is it fires perfectly, and I've never been around a kiln that fires as well as this one does. And um, it's a gas kiln, and, and way back in 1975, Ishiko built the thing with a, a chamber that takes the waste heat from a 2,350-degree firing, and, and we can fire a whole load of kiln of, of pieces which are, are raw, and they'll they'll fire to a bisque temperature, which is what we need to do to apply the glaze. So it's a very, um, it's a very good kiln. And, if, and I think, as I said before, when Toshiko could make big pieces, she, she stopped needing to do um, weaving and painting. That's just my guess. And out here in this courtyard, um, almost all the work that's lying around is, uh, is from people who work here, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, 
First of all, Kimberly, are we um, are we working okay on the Zoom? Yep, everything is yep. great. It's yeah. So for people um, just here, I know it's a little bit choppy, but we haven't actually lost connection in our tr test, so I think we're okay. So yeah, it looks great. Well, this is a this is a, the one way to shoot those piece we have outside, and that's because we sort of resurrected it from the mud behind the kiln where it had been laying. It was all very badly broken up. The whole base was broken off. But uh, Bill Bumbach, another student and apprentice, he's one of the few people who was a full year-long apprentice and a student, um, we, he uh, devised a, a way of pulling it out of the mud and turning it upside down and filling it with foam and then adding adding the pieces that were broken on and securing them with epoxy foam inside. And it's been here the for 12 years since we did that. And now we've come up with a um a picture of uh Dan Anderson among other people putting it together um before it broke. And here are the, the bells that Toshiko had cast from, um, from clay maquettes. And um, I, think, I think at least the one back there uh, will be at the Noguchi Museum show in March. Um, they want one of them. I'm, I'm never sure which one uh, they'll take. That that show will open March 20th. There's a very good show at MFA Boston uh, up now, and it'll be up for a year. So, you know, Toshiko's coming into her own. Now we can go back inside and these these things that look like a funny mess here. That was a project for the Hunter and Art Museum. They needed a raku firing done. And so we did a couple of raku firing for them for one of their classes. They're the working working folks. Now here, um, this is the studio bathroom, and it's all, um, the floor is all covered with uh, very nice tiles. And Toshiko made hundreds of those tiles. And uh, her bathroom, and from her um, bedroom, has a, uh, the showers walls tiled with those tiles also. And two of her houses in Hawaii had the bathrooms with handmade by Toshiko tiles. So, and if we if we have a minute, I'll just tell the the sequel to the Carl Massa story. Um her best friends in in um, Clinton, pretty much from the day she arrived, were, were Pearl and Vincent Chaffee. And Vincent was um, back from New York and telling about uh, news from Italy. And um, he was trying to figure out there's a, a relative who had just passed. And he was um, describing his life, he said this this fellow and his brother, they had lost their parents on the same day from the influenza epidemic of 1919 or something. And so they were sent to uh, Duke University 
to look up a professor there with an, an envelope that just that described their predicament and enough money to get them there. And the, the professor was an uncle of theirs. And one was sent to Yale and one was sent to MIT and they had successful work. And, um, and he said, I can't remember their name. And this is the guy I used to play with when I was a kid in Brooklyn. And Toshika said, I know his name. It's Carl Massa, the same person that she had fallen in love with in 1944 during the war, um, who was working for the army doing um, uh, top topological models of islands to be invaded, um, was a cousin of the man who became her best friend in Clinton. And um, this photograph here was also done by a blue-eyed Italian man who, when I called him up, he said, well, we kept company for a while, Toshiko Anani. And um, so anyway, maybe there's a theme there, blue-eyed Italian men. But uh, she, she, she never married. Um, she was in love a few times, I think. She never discussed it with me at all, um, ex except to say that one person she couldn't have really loved because otherwise she would have been happy if he was happy and she wasn't happy. So that was her philosophy. And I don't know what we have on time. Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, so um, we'll kind of open it up. If you do have a question or want to comment on something, please feel free to unmute yourself. It'd be great if you turn your video on as well. Um, and yeah, we'll just open it up to everybody. Don? Uh-huh. It's Jane here. Um, I mean, this is wonderful. I'm learning so much, even though I've known a lot over the decades. But I, I wonder if you could speak about her gardening, which was yeah, a huge was a, part of life there. She was a passionate uh, gardener. She had a very nice garden that, that um, uh, tree peonies and all kinds of plants, not all the names of which I know. And she was extremely uh, committed and devoted to her vegetable garden. And um, now we have a vegetable garden here, but it's not where Kishiko had it. It's, it's the, the trees. Um, the trees on the stream next to us have shaded where Tashiko's old garden was. We'll just we'll just walk over. Maybe all Carla has bare feet. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just Tell me if the internet gives up here. Um, um, we're still okay. But uh, right over there was where Tashiko's vegetable garden was, yeah. and you can see it's very much shaded. But but right through there, um, well, there's some light and a car parked in a garage, if you can make it out. Um, there's another house that came up for sale and probably foolishly, I, I bought it for our artist residency. And we have two resident artists living over there. Um, one of whom has ALS. She was a choreographer and dancer in New York City and she was, I uh, got ALS and, and happily for us, we got to meet her. Unhappily, it's only because she had ALS. So it's one of these impossible things in life. But we have a vegetable garden in the sun on the south side of that, the house next door, as we call it. Um, over here, these these big trees just are too shady. And we, we haven't had the courage to cut them down, but probably they're going to fall down and crush the cars in the parking lot next door or something. But she she very sincerely 
considered gardening and cooking to be extremely important parts of being an artist. And, and she didn't, um, she felt sorry uh, for people who, who didn't cook and who didn't garden. And she was very happy with me all the years I was going broke in Oregon. I had a big garden and I cooked a lot. And she was mad at me once for, for anyway, a year or more. And then th there came a time when we, we had to make lunch for people who were coming and we hadn't expected them. And I was put in charge of that. So I was, I was cutting uh, onions at high speed. And, and Toshiko said, oh, Don. And I looked at her and she was, uh, by this time she was 86 or so. And she had her head in her chin and she was looking up at me. And she said, oh, I forgot that you were a chef. <laughs> I, it had been many years since I had worked as a chef, but once upon a time, I, I cooked in an Italian restaurant in Oregon to make ends meet a little bit. But she considered cooking and gardening extremely important. Important, uh, important parts of inspiration. And she got many ideas she, she felt from that. Um, any other thoughts or questions? I. Yep, go ahead. Hi, Joy. Go ahead. Hi. I don't really have a question. I just want to thank you. This has been so fun. I always wondered what the place was like. And um, I, I was able to see it all except when you showed her kiln, and then I had to pay my plumber. So. Oh. <laughs> Anyway, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, we can. What, what we'll do is I'll, I'll I'll wander back out into the courtyard, and if there's a minute or two, we can sure? go back yeah. to the film. Wasn't she at the University of Chicago at one time? Uh, she was not. Oh, um, I thought she was. I don't. I don't <laughs> believe so. I I never heard of it. Okay. Um, and I had I had close friends who were. Uh, much involved at the University of Chicago, not in the art department, but um, medical school and so on. Okay. Um, so, I've been to the I've been to the open uh, house that was uh, some years back that I enjoyed seeing the studio and the house, and this has been absolutely marvelous. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh! You're most welcome. That's the kiln. Wow. And, and it's a big kiln. Yeah. Um, we keep threatening to build a smaller kiln because we we like to have workshops and things. And waiting for this kiln to get full can make the workshops uh, anticlimactic, <laughs> where people have to wait months for to see their work. But it's a it's a very good kiln. There's some work by Bill Bumbach that's just waiting to get in. Mm -hmm. And. Um, those, How could one get on the on the list to be notified about workshops there? And well, open, um, open houses as well that happen a couple times a year. Yeah, they're, they're, the Hundred and Art Museum does all our workshops. And for the open house, um, write to me. I'm I'm Don at vtakaetsustudio.com. So T H E T A K A E Z U studio.com. And um, if you look up, uh, if you look up Takeitsu studio.com online, it'll get you to what we all consider a very inadequate website. On the other hand, we've spent about 10 years trying to get somebody to do a better job. And, and nobody does, but we have high hopes on somebody doing it any day now. But um, anyway, that's the that's the bit you missed. Thank you.
Yeah, this has been really wonderful. Just so neat to see an artist's space and where she was working and all of these, um, all of her pieces. Um, anybody else have any other questions or thoughts um, they would like to share? I'll just prompt Don one more time to say, could you just give a rundown of places where her work is in the collections of various museums and parks and things? Oh, yeah, there are a lot. I, I'm just going to let people look at Toshiko and three of her last five apprentices. And she, she really had a, a, a good eye, I think, for manly beauty. Um. <laughs> But it's always fun to be with her apprentices because they're awfully nice looking fellas. <laughs> she didn't only have male apprentices, of course. She she often often had women. Um but she did have, I think, a little weakness for for men. Um Speaking of which, okay, so place where she has uh, work, Honolulu, of course, a very good collection. Um, uh, the Metropolitan Museum has a number of her pieces. The Museum of Art and Design has a good collection. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art has a superb piece and a good collection. Um, MFA Boston has a very nice collection. Um, Houston has a lot of work. Seattle has a lot of work. Um, I don't know if anything in Oregon has, has a work, but, um, uh, what about Cranbrook in a, uh, this? Cran Cranbrook does, by the way, the Noguchi show will be traveling from um from from Cranbrook uh from the Noguchi Museum to Cranbrook to the um uh Chasen Museum I think at the University of Wisconsin it was just added to the tour um to Honolulu no to uh Houston and then to Honolulu so it um it's going to go to a number of of those museums I believe Miami has a good collection. Um, the the Young Art Museum has a number of works. I don't think they've ever been showed. We were we were hoping that they would join the um, uh, tour, but there were some uh, upheavals at the executive levels. I think there, um, and they didn't. They they weren't able to do it. And when is the show in New York? It's March 20th, it opens. The show in Boston is open now. And it, it's really a good show, very worthwhile. It's it's not a, a huge retrospective, but it, it's, it's, it's nicely focused. The reason I'm pointing you at these things is they're uh, by Toshiko's very great friend from Asilomar in 1957, where they left, where they met. Um, to uh to the to Lenore Tawney's death. There were many alphabetical groupings of uh brilliant artists working in the crafts, because it's Takeetsu and Tawny, and it was hard to fit anybody in there alphabetically between them. And uh, I will say that I thought Lenore was a pain in the neck, and of course she didn't particularly even think of me once that I know of. All the years I worked here, she was just, if I couldn't be running an errand for her, she wasn't interested. But very late in life, Toshiko said to me, she called me up and said, no, this is the, there, there's always a question of whether they had a romantic relationship. And here's a Valentine's Day card from Lenore to Toshiko. So I let anybody apply whatever evidence they want on that. Um, I, I never saw any sign of it, but I was 25 and I wouldn't have been told anything. Um, 
but they were very, very close. And Toshiko called me up and said, I, I did something wrong. And I said, oh, what's that? And she said, I told Lenore that you would take her to the best Indian restaurant in New York. And I said, okay, well, let me know. And she said, no, I'm letting you know. It's tonight. So I said, okay, <laughs> meet me at Madras Palace. <laughs> And Lenore was my best friend ever after. I mean, we never exchanged a phone call, but if I ever walked into the room and she heard my voice, she would call me over and hold my hand as long as I could stay. So uh, Indian food was the way to her heart. And um, this, this letter is a very touching uh, letter explaining why. Um, no, it's not. Uh, no, no, that's not the letter. There is somewhere here a very touching letter where Lenore said, I, I want you to know why I pounded on the floor last night. For six years, Lenore lived in the upstairs apartment here, which I can't get to because of the house painting operation going on. Um, and she said, she said, I'd just come back from the doctor and he told me that my glaucoma was never going to get better. It was only going to get worse, and I was going to be functionally blind in a year. And I couldn't get to sleep, and I'd finally gotten to sleep, and you turned your TV set on when you came up from the studio at 4 in the morning. And I, I was so upset that I screamed and pounded on the floor. But I shouldn't have done it, and I'm very sorry. So that was... Uh, to me, very touching, knowing Lenore. I, I don't think perhaps she ever apologized to anybody in her life other than that. But anyway, there, there were very, um, there were very big talents and very, you know, very wonderful friends. Um, so it must be about one minute to one because yep. Jane is running. Yes. So, so thank you I, all for listening. Yeah. One quick question. The show in New York, that's different than the show that's in Boston, right? Yeah, completely different. Okay. No no where, overlap at all. And where in New York is it going to be at? It'll be at the Noguchi Museum in Queens. Okay, okay got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. All right, so any last questions or thoughts before we say goodbye? Um, so this has been really awesome. I always enjoy these things. I hope everybody else has as well. Um, to Don and Carla, I appreciate your your time and, and thoughtfulness and putting this all together and it, you know just sharing um, you know everything that you have. It's just been really terrific to be able to see all of this. So thank you to all. Um, and yeah, I'll just say a big thank you and hope to see you all again soon in 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 our meetings. Thank you.